Kumilang Molweni. As you may notice, I am not Wafa Al Sadr. I am Sinead Delaney Moretwe, and I am from Vitsari Chai in Johannesburg. Uh, but I, it falls upon me as the proud South African to welcome you to Cape Town. And as you, some of you may know, September for us is Heritage Month. So I thought I would start by welcoming you in at least four of the official languages of South Africa. So, Ria le amochela, or Sianamkela, or ons welcome yo, or welcome. Uh, and for those of you who come from further afield, Karibusana. <laughs> Uh, and I hope that you will come up to me after this session and <laughs> inform me of the other languages I may have missed out. So welcome to Cape Town. If you were here on the weekend, you will know why it's called the Cape of Storms. Uh, and I really do want to acknowledge also for many of the communities around Cape Town, just the kind of significant devastation that the storms have wreaked on this province and other parts of the, the coast. Um, and, you know, kind of reflect that really kind of we are living in a time of climate change and uncertainty where weather events are, are something that seem to be happening to all of us. Uh, and, you know, kind of it feels like there are multiple challenges, but we are here to kind of talk about a long standing challenge, which is HIV and which is still a significant burden uh, in our region. Um, but also kind of to say that Cape Town is also known as the Cape of Good Hope. Uh, and I hope that you can enjoy the time that we are here together to be together, to really exchange ideas, to come up with new concepts, to, I think, learn how to navigate those ideas to new studies in the network, to meet colleagues, to enjoy making connections, I think after many years of not being able to make connections uh, and really to kind of celebrate sort of the diversity that a network like this brings and sort of what it means for kind of what we can do together in the face of sort of multiple global challenges. And I, I want to really acknowledge the um, funders who've supported our uh, coming together but also the HPTN leadership who recognize the value of these regional meetings, particularly I think for us uh, in the African region who sometimes kind of don't get to participate fully in some of the annual events and to the, the members of the LOC who I know have worked very hard to make this uh, um, a, a, a meeting that we will all sort of get a lot out of. And also to all of you who've really taken the time out of what I know are busy schedules to to be here and to participate actively in this meeting. I think that the agenda reflects some great sessions. We have some excellent speakers here today who are really gonna set the scene for, for some of the discussions that we hope to have. And we're in wonderful surroundings and who would have believed <laughs> we were kind of in the middle of storms on the weekend. So I think we look forward to hearing your thoughts and ideas and to really celebrating the diversity of this network. So really just to say again, Riale Mochela, Sianam Kele, welcome and enjoy. Uh, good morning, my name is Mike Cohen. I'm one of the leaders of the network and um, like I won't reiterate uh, Sinead's beautiful uh, welcome, but I think we all feel the same way. It's the first time in many years we've all been back together in Africa. Uh, so it, it feels both like old and kind of weird. <laughs> um, so let me, and, and let me apologize in advance, the jet lag of old Americans is very massive. So let's, let's see if I can actually talk for 20 minutes without like stumbling and, uh, and, and succeed in doing what I'd like to do. So we're gonna talk about the network and I'm gonna point out to you the kind of strengths and opportunities through the network. Um, you'll see the network has a leadership and since I'm not wearing a mask, you can see me, Dr. El Sadr is delayed. Also with us are Deborah Donnell, raise your hand. 
uh, representing our statistical center. Um, oops, okay, what happened here? Deborah Dunnell representing our statistical center, Mark Marzinki representing our laboratory, Nero uh, Pamasista representing the operations of the organization and me. And then there are others who play a role in our executive committee. When I show these slides, you can have these slides, they're available and they'll be on our website. So it's not a question of trying to like get every detail out of these slides, it's the big picture I'm trying to convey. And the big picture is that even right now, with everything that's happened, we have 78 trials that we've uh, completed. We've enrolled a remarkable, and when I say we, I mean all the people in this audience, we've enrolled a remarkable 172,000 subjects in clinical trials. Uh, we've had 800 publications. Um, and uh, if you look, we've, we've made a lot of contributions in this network. There's almost because we don't have an HIV vaccine, there's only three things you can do with the disease. You can prevent it, treat it, and cure it. We don't know how to cure AIDS. And for prevention, we would like to have a vaccine. There is no vaccine. And there's not gonna be a vaccine in the immediate future. So having said that, if you look at the slide over time, you can see that the network has made really big contributions under different leadership. And these contributions have really shaped HIV prevention for the planet. And what our goal here is at this meeting is to think about what's next. We've done pretty well, actually, because HIV incidence, the new cases are less. Survival is fantastic when people get treated, but we know we can do better, even in the absence of a vaccine. And that's really the purpose of the meeting. Now, the, probably the biggest thing that happened out of the network in its entire time is HB10052 and the U equals U campaign of trying to get every person who's infected to know their status without stigma and to get treated, which is both life-saving and clearly prevents onward transmission. So on a planetary basis, the network becomes responsible for this kind of mainstay of, of HIV prevention on the planet. But there's a lot of other things that we're doing. And at this meeting in, in particular, we'll talk a lot about pre-exposure prophylaxis, which we've helped to develop and which, uh, as you know, the, many of the, uh, virtually all of you in this room have worked in one way or the other on pre-exposure prophylaxis, and that'll be a dominant theme. Now, getting staying with this U equals U theme just for a minute, there's this aspiration and these little red dots show uh, what are called fast track cities versus business as usual. And the argument is that if you do, if you introduce U equals U, test and treat as aggressively as possible, you massively reduce the new cases of HIV and the fast track cities seem to support that. And Harriet will talk about this. Harriet who's on the stage, raise your hand. She's gonna talk about the same idea in more detail with the data that's been generated through her work. <clears throat> so we have, 69 research sites. And what's important for this meeting, this weekend, this week is the 22 African sites. All 22 African sites are represented. And, and in all candor, there's been nothing more important to the network than the African sites over all the years of the network. They've been incredibly productive. Let's have a round of applause. They're just, it, it, the African sites, the African investigators, all of you here have just been remarkable in every possible way in contributions uh, to prevention of HIV. And so there's nothing that would have happened in this network without, without the sites that are represented here. Um, as you know, oops, this, this is organized in some weird way. Now, one, one point to make, you, you, everyone here had to deal with COVID. And, and what another remarkable feature is two things that when the COVID pandemic struck, most of you, all of the sites, um, most of you are called on to become COVIDologists. There were no COVIDologists on the planet. No one knew anything about COVID. So all the sites then, almost all the sites worked on COVID vaccines and COVID monoclonal antibodies and COVID prevention and really made a huge contribution through the COVID prevention network, which was really nothing more than the, than the VTN and the PTN coming together. We enrolled uh, something like several hundred thousand people in all the vaccine trials. So, and we developed all those monoclonal antibodies. So you can take a great deal of pride in, in contributing to COVID. And you kept all the HIV stuff going, which is even more remarkable. Somehow you found ways to get people enrolled in trials to your clinics and to manage the, the trials. And so none of the trials were stopped during COVID. So again, it's just quite remarkable. Now, 
The VTN is our partner, as you'll see as we talk, but they acknowledge that there's no vaccine in the immediate future. And so it really redoubles the importance of this meeting in finding new strategies. Now, everything for us is pretty simple. It's all on this one slide. There's no vaccine. And in the absence of a vaccine, we only have two options. We can do behavioral interventions, which we have to do on every possible study. We have to find ways to make people more comfortable participating in the studies, if they're receiving medications, to receive the medication, and so on and so forth. And then we have structural interventions, which are all kinds of things we put into place um, to try and help people succeed in, in preventing HIV. And, but then for our network in particular, we have a whole series of biomedical interventions and those interventions are status neutral. What does that mean? It means whether everybody on the planet is either HIV positive or HIV negative. That really doesn't matter to us. Therefore, everybody on the planet deserves some HIV prevention strategy. And that strategy either is, if you're infected, a strategy to help you live a normal life and remain non-contagious. And if you're not infected, a prevention strategy. So it's neutral to whatever status you are whenever we, we have an opportunity uh, to evaluate that. And so this is our big goal on that slide in a sense. So as I've said already, at this meeting, I know we will talk about the U equals U treatment as prevention part quite a bit. But you know, that's very well established and it's, and it's, it's, a, it's like an adult, it's mature. Pre-exposure prophylaxis is more like a young person. It's less, much less mature. So we have to talk about doing better with pre-exposure prophylaxis. We know we have a lot of challenges to take the highest risk people and keep those people negative, which is what we're really challenged to do. If we had a vaccine, that would be easy. We could keep people negative with a vaccine, but we don't have a vaccine. So we're gonna use a lot of pre-exposure prophylaxis. Now, the first issue is that all of you in this audience developed the drug cabotegravir, HBTN, with three, two studies, HBTN-083 and HBTN-084. Those studies were enormously difficult, very 7,000 subjects, roughly. I, I can't know the exact number. We have Sinead Delaney, more weight way, and uh, Ray Fee Landovitz, who led those two studies. But the most important thing is those studies remarkably went from an idea of this long acting agent to the approval of all of governments all over the world. And that's all because of the work we did. So this really deserves a round of applause. And, and I would also say that the NIH has difficulty, they're not a drug company, and they work really tirelessly to go with the FDA and make that drug approved by the FDA, by the South African government, by the European medicine agencies, which is a really tough organization. And so the NIH people work, and the FHI people work really tirelessly to make this happen. A round of applause was really well deserved. Now, we're really not through with cabotegravir in all candor. Uh, Sinead's gonna talk about this, I believe quite a bit at this meeting. One of the big commitments in the network going forward, so this is point one, for those who are thinking, what am I gonna do next? Is commitment to women of childbearing age. We just haven't done enough there's, to women of childbearing age, and that includes women who are pregnant, who often don't have access to drugs that would prevent them from getting HIV during pregnancy. And once they get HIV during pregnancy, we have to deal with the, the mom's problem and the prevention of transmission to the baby. So Sinead will talk about this, and this will be discussed in great detail, but in thinking, the women at childbearing age is a really critical aspect of this network at this point. And this will be in collaboration. You might say, well, what about the other networks and other people? We're not like an exclusive group. We're rather uh, open. So we will collaborate with anybody that is appropriate to collaborate with to, to work on these problems. Um, and I, I guess I mentioned this. Move on. Right here. Now, so the cabotegravir drug works for at least two months after it's injected. It might work for three months, especially in women for a variety of reasons. And it might work, I've just heard recently, and Sinead may know more about this, for four months in women. I don't know, Sinead, right? Okay, I just heard that, Gil, that Vive believes it works for four months. I, I have no idea what your thoughts are about that. Mark says no. I'm just conveying what they want. This may be there. At any rate, it works for at least two months. We can all agree on that. So, but there have to be alternatives because people like choices in life and we know that alternatives are good. So the Gilead company is developing a drug called lenacapavir, which is a capsid inhibitor, a very different kind of drug. Many of you may be involved in their studies in, in Africa. 
of, of called Purpose One and Purpose Two. But we're partner, and so you're shaking. I see Purpose Two people or Purpose One people. That's great. So that drug is in trials to develop the drug. We're partners with Gilead on, on studies called Purpose Three and Purpose Four. Those are, are um, the Purpose Three study is in the United States in women um, uh, who would need access to long acting prevention. The Purpose Four study is for people who inject drugs. So it's not very relevant to Africa, but if, if that product, lenacapavir, gets fully developed, I'm quite sure we'll work with them in the future in big studies in Africa. So I would think of this is just the beginning of that, that drug, lenacapavir. Just be aware that it's in development. All right. A huge amount of effort has gone into a whole nother idea. And this idea is, is I would call it a little bit controversial. It's the idea that um, for, for, since Alexander Fleming, the guy with penicillin, infectious disease people have loved small, what are called small molecules, penicillin being the best example. But there's an alternative. You can use host defenses to prevent or treat infection. How do you do that? You make monoclonal antibodies. So 40 years ago, we learned how to make these. And now monoclonal antibodies are becoming a big deal in infectious disease. The best example of the big deal, there's two good examples. The best example is a drug that can prevent respiratory syncytial virus in infants. As you know, babies often get terrible RSV, especially premature babies. We can give these babies an injection once a year that when they're born, and that antibody they get will prevent RSV. And that's been approved in the United States and probably worldwide by now. So we know that this can work, that idea can work. Then when COVID came along, we know we made monoclonal antibodies that saved many, many lives. There were no drugs available. This is before Paxlovid and all the other drugs. The person who's most famous to be saved is President Trump. So President Trump uh, acquired HIV and was very, very sick. He was almost certainly not gonna survive. We gave him a huge amount of a drug. <laughs> You're laughing. Uh, I, this is not a political meeting. Okay, so, so President Trump was really sick and we gave him a huge dose of the drug called Regencov, which we developed with Regeneron. And that drug certainly saved his life because it really worked. It bound up all the, the COVID. So we know we can make monoclonal antibodies that work. What about in the HIV field? So in the HIV field, we know that the virus evolves on one side and the antibodies evolve on the other side. And 20% of people make what are called broad neutralizing antibodies. And so what happened was, oops, we go back. What happened was we did a giant study with you doing an unbelievable job, you in this audience. We did a giant study called AMP, Ant Antibody Mediated Prevention, with a drug called VRCO1, a single agent. It was not done for licensing. It wasn't done to make a drug. It was done to see if we could do it. And we actually succeeded in en enrolling uh, thousands of people. We gave 44,000 infusions, you, not we, we you, gave 44,000 infusions of this monoclonal antibody with no serious adverse effects. So the safety of these antibodies was demonstrated. We gave the 44,000 infusions and learned a ton about this monoclonal antibody. It told us that the idea probably could work, but it was gonna be hard to accomplish. Now, on this next slide, at the same time, other so you'll see the PTN and the VTN are the main players in testing monoclonal antibodies for HIV prevention. But there are other groups that are shown in smaller colors that have enrolled small numbers of subjects using different antibodies. So it's not just us that are pursuing monoclonal antibodies for both prevention and treatment. But VTN and PTN are the biggest partners. Now, what's important is, is on this slide. It's too complicated to read. In yellow are the things that are really right upon us now. And I'm going to give you the basic idea. And I believe uh, Narazzo is going to talk, who's somewhere here is going to talk, Narazzo, you're going to talk about this in great detail. Okay, so you don't really, what I'm saying is just a brief summary, and that is we're doing phase one studies, mostly in the United States right now, but, but we'll, or South Africa, phase one studies to test three antibodies in combination that would be given intravenously. And these three antibodies, we, we think, could be as effective as cabotegravir. Now, of course, my friends who are the Cabotegravir people sitting, that's the Cabotegravir ta table over there. The, the Cabotegravir table doesn't like this, okay? Because they're thinking, you know, this is crazy. We give you one shot or two shots. We give you some shots and you're done. And you guys are going to sit there for an hour or half an hour and get an infusion of three antibodies. But this would give people a choice. These antibodies, if we're successful, will last six months. 
And we're just at the beginning of this with three antibodies. The three antibodies, I'll just tell you the names that they're, it's VRCO1523, PDGM1400, PDG121, and PDGM1400, three antibodies. And, and how do I know this might happen? Because we've already, we're making these antibodies right now. It costs a lot of money to make these antibodies. We're making the antibodies. So we're going to get for sure as far as phase, as phase one studies. And there's a time, and I even know there's a timeline in partnership with the VTN. And why is this important to this meeting? Because if this all happens, this, this would be a giant trial for licensure, just like AMP. That this would be a licensure trial of three antibodies heavily conducted in the African continent. But we're a long way away from this. This is not tomorrow. We're at phase one. We haven't even begun serious phase one yet. So this is just by way of forewarning that we hope this is gonna happen because you did such a great job with AMP. We think we could prove or disprove that this works and make a drug if this works. And this would be an alternative. So that would give us three long acting PrEP agents. Cabotegravir at the Cabotegravir table, Lenacapavir if it works, and then, so those would be three different options for long acting PrEP. And we hope that we can contribute in that regard. And this is kind of where we are right now. Now, the big challenge for us, if we get as far as the phase one works, we have to have a, pro a manufacturer, like a company that's going to make it, and they have to be a commercial partner, like a big drug company, and we have to do an ethical clinical trial, and Deborah will talk about clinical trial designs, and then we have to know how to implement infusing people that where a drug would last for six months. Now, it is, our, it is my belief and Dr. Corey's belief at BTN that the success in AMP suggests that some people are gonna want, are gonna want this for their prevention. Some people are gonna want drugs every six months. And how do I know that? I don't know it for sure, but I know looking at the cabotegravir table, the cabotegravir is incredibly popular in the United States at least, that people really like it. So people like long acting stuff. I also know that it's very hard from every study that you have done, that it's hard for people to take daily pills every day, tenofovir in particular, it almost has not worked out well for us. Okay, now the next big study that I need to bring your attention, and this is very likely to happen, is a really big deal for us at this point in time. And that is one pill, and I've already said a little bad about pills, but I'll say something good about pills. One pill that would give birth control and Truvada in one pill. Now, this, is, this pill is being made by a company called Viatris, and they've succeeded at a point where they're very likely to be able to make the pills to give to us. And if they give us these pills, when they give us these pills, we will do a study called HPTN 104, in which we will uh, uh, give uh, women of childbearing age who want a, a, a prevention of pregnancy and prevention of HIV, we'll, we'll explore whether these pills do what they're supposed to do. If we made, and this is called multi-purpose technology, if we succeed, this would be a really big thing, that there'd be a pill to prevent pregnancy and HIV in one pill. So we're really excited about this. And we're so excited about this that even though the pill doesn't exist, many of you in this audience have already been selected as the sites for the study. How many sites, Nero? The pill, the pill exists, Nero is correcting me, which is appropriate. She points out the pill exists, it just doesn't exist in bottles to give out. Will you accept that statement? And we need FDA approval in order to go forward. So four sites, how many sites in Africa? Here, four. So four sites have already been selected for this trial, but if this works in the preliminary trial, we'll probably do a much bigger trial uh, for, for many different purposes. So we're very excited about this study with the DP pill, the dual purpose pill. Does it have a name? And Harriet, does it have a name? Harriet is the is one of the principal investigators of the study. Does the pill have a name, Harriet? The two pill, you, what do you, the DPP, we're gonna call it Harriet. So the, <laughs> I think we'll name the pill after you unless you oppose. Okay. <laughs> All right, so now I'm trying to show you the way forward. Uh, we're, we have a lot. Of, so you might say, okay, the sites right now don't have as much to do as they've historically done because of COVID, because we've completed trials. I'm trying to show at least part of the way forward. And we hope in this meeting, we'll hear from you the rest of the way forward. That's the purpose of the meeting. So part of the way forward that I've said so far is more prep, long acting prep, dual purpose pills, but there's another issue. The other issue is as we paid so much attention to HIV, 
there's a giant problem on this planet with STDs in particular, and they're not really separate, right? HIV and STDs live in the same, classical STDs, syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, they live in the same neighborhood. Many of you here are running STD clinics where you find the people that you need to prevent HIV or treat HIV. So we're very interested in expanding the network back to its roots really of doing much, much more with classical STDs, syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia. Along those lines, there is, a, there is the idea that a vaccine called Bexero that's for meningococcus can prevent gonorrhea. A study is going on in the United States in men who have sex with men, to, 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 not the United States, US and other places to see if MSM can be protected from gonorrhea through this drug called Bexero, a, a, a vaccine. We have started doing a study in Malawi with Mitch Matoga and Mina Hassinifer who are here to test the Bexero drug in women to see if it can prevent gonorrhea in women. That, that study is funded, approved. If it works, we'll expand it. If, it if, if the preliminary data suggests it works in women, we'll do it in, in many more sites in, in trying to prove that Bexero works. And there are other meningococcal vaccines that could be tested for gonorrhea. But the bigger issue is not this, not this study, which is on this slide. The bigger issue is not this study of the Bexero vaccine. The bigger issue is think about STDs. Think about what we as a network <clears throat> might tell the NIH we would like to do to prevent syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia. Syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia, those three big diseases. NIH has tried to make vaccines. We're still trying, not successfully. The networks could contribute in that space, and we expect to do more STD work going forward, and a whole session in this meeting will be devoted to STD work. Um, now, this is an aside, we're in Africa, so there's no reason to focus on the United States, but in the United States, we're doing three other studies that are of importance to us because the US has a very small epidemic of 30 or 40,000 people per uh, new cases per year, mostly in the Southern United States, almost all in 60% in men who have sex with men. And these kinds of studies we're doing in the United States, 091, 094, and 096, they're devoted to some combination of people who inject drugs, and, and uh, men who have sex with men, mostly in the Southern United States. 094 is a very unique study because vans drive around helping people who inject drugs get prevention, <coughs> either PrEP or other prevention treatment um, activities. <coughs> 091 is for transgender people. Now we have some pilot studies and the pilots are important because tomorrow morning, I believe at eight, we're talking about how you might help to develop your own pilot studies through concepts. The pilot studies we're doing are gonna be discussed at this meeting and there's, uh, there are meetings about them. There's uh, HBT 111, um, which is a, a trial in Uganda, exploring bar barber shops as sites where we can do prevention activities. Um, HBT uh, 112, <coughs> which is uh, being conducted in Malawi about STD clinics um, and HBT 13, um, which is a study in the United States and, and South, Southern America. But HPTM 111 and 112, many of you are participating in it. We'll, it'll be discussed at this meeting. Community is like everything in this network because if the communities don't believe that, they're, that they should participate in clinical trials, there is no network. So you can't spend enough time um, worrying about like, are we doing the right thing? Are we, are we creating an environment where people wanna participate in our clinical trials? So we have lots of community engagement activities um, and they're kind of, some of these are summarized on this slide, but you can't say enough about like how much we have to do to try and create an environment where people wanna participate in trials and where the communities benefit from the trials. Now, I think clearly with, with most of our work, the communities have benefited enormously. And that is an ongoing challenge always to make sure that the cost and the benefit line up for people who participate in trials. We have a scholars program, David Sirwada has been one of the leaders of it. He's gonna talk about it today. <clears throat> There's a lot of scholars, 60 scholars, they've all done well. We're very proud of the scholars program. As I said, David will talk about it in more detail. These are the current scholars. I think a couple are, uh, will speak and David told me one six, so he's gonna speak on his behalf. So this is where the network is. This is a giant network. It's embedded in Africa, 22 African sites. In, in many different African countries. It's been a success by any definition because all the HIV prevention on the planet 
And this sounds arrogant, but I think it's true. Everything that's HIV prevention on this planet, since we don't have a vaccine, and now in adults, because we don't deal with infants, and I see my pediatrician, my own personal pediatrician colleague here, we take no credit for all the terrific work done in vertical transmission and uh, and in, in, in all the work done with children. So I think that needs to be acknowledged. But for adults, this network, you have contributed to virtually everything that's done on this planet to prevent HIV. So the real question is, what's next? Are you done? Is this, is this good enough? Or can we do better? And that's the whole purpose of this meeting. We haven't been together in five years. This is our, I don't know what year we were together last. We're together for the first time. It's pretty exciting. Um, you get to see old friends. And I expect good things will come out of this. So I want to thank the NIH, the Gates Foundation, all the drug companies, uh, the USAID. We have a lot of sponsors. And remember, this network is sponsored not just by NIAID, but by NICHT, NIAID, NIDA, and other and the Fogarty Center. So we have four sponsors of our network, which is a little bit unusual because they all work together. And then we have the Gates Foundation, USAID, and drug companies, um, many different drug companies. So I want to thank them. I especially want to thank all of you for making this journey here to be with us. I hope this is incredibly productive. The more ideas you have, the better. The more you feel connected to this work, and that it's important and you realize that there's a trajectory from everybody dying of HIV in 1984 to people living normal lives with HIV from and from this ever rising trajectory to falling trajectory in most countries, which I think unequivocally this network can, has part can, contributed to. So you have to feel good about this and you have to tell us what's next. That's what's really important. What do we do next? So thank you for listening, thanks. I, oh, what's next? I guess I'm supposed to say what's next. So what's, or maybe Niru is. You can leave. <laughs> are, you, are, you, are you the what's next person? Okay. <laughs> Together we are. So I think what's next is Deborah Donnell is going to talk to us. Deborah Donnell being the leader of our statistical center and a very articulate young woman. Um, so, so, so. <laughs> of course, for Mike, anyone younger than him is young. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I really want to talk to you today um, when we're talking about future designs for HIV prevention about the problems we have wrought through our huge successes with HIV prevention and um, what it means about the difficult path ahead we have for future products. So, um, you know, I'm going to talk to you about, we now have these multiple ARV based forms of HIV prevention, most recently cabotegravir which can reduce, which can basically reduce the number, you know, prevent nine out of 10 infections in people who are taking cabotegravir of potential infections. And now that we have really effective prevention available, how the heck are we gonna pro pro approach future testing of new products? So I, I'm basically gonna talk to you about um, when novel, when these things are uh, effective, a potential strategy is to try and estimate infection rates using a counterfactual placebo. Um, and this is important because we need to ensure that we have reliable evidence for future prevention products to give us new choices. Most of us in this room, many of us in this room have actually lived through two er eras of HIV prevention. Um, when I first started designing trials, we had placebo controls. Um, in 2012, Truvada was approved for prevention and we have now proceeded to do trials with Truvada as an active control or for monoclonal antibodies and vaccine trials, we have allowed everybody in the trial to use Truvada and done a placebo control. Now with cabotegravir, with the ability to prevent, you know, nine out of 10 infections, um, it's not clear what the future is gonna be for future trial designs. When we, so we've been in the situation before when we had an active control, when we developed Truvada, and there are essentially three strategies we have used with active controls. One, we've done an experimental compared to the active control. And I want to be really clear here. When I say an experimental agent, I'm meaning an unproven agent. So for example, at the moment, that would be a triple monoclonal antibody, a monthly pill, or a vaccine. And when I say active agent, I'm talking about a proven agent, which at the moment would be FTC, TDF, FTAF, or CAB-LA, uh, for example. Um, the other two strategies that have been used is even in the presence of an active control that we know is works for prevention, 
um, we continue to do a placebo randomization, but allow everybody to use whatever prevention they want to use. A, a third strategy that was used in the Mosaico trial is to do continue with a placebo control, but to screen people and only enroll people who are not wanting to use existing prevention. All right. So now that we have cabotegravir and it has been approved for prevention, what in 2021 it was approved, um, which one of these strategies we're going to carry forward is a mad, is an ongoing conversation. And um, happily for you, I'm not going to debate what we should use going forward. Instead, in this talk, I'm going to focus on this first strategy where it, we consider, we think about what we would do in a trial if cabotegravir was going to be used as the active control. So we have an active control, we're, we're preventing nine out of 10 infections. We want, we have a new agent, whether it be a monoclonal antibody, a vaccine, or another antiretroviral prevention, and we want to we want to use that trial design to move forward. So how would we go about doing that? So let me tell you about the difficulties we have of this. And so in the top here, I'm showing you the active control trials that have done where Truvada was used as an active control. And the bottom, I'm using the placebo control trials where Truvada was used in the background. Um, and the problem you can see here is on the experimental arms of the active control, um, we are seeing incidence rates that are between essentially two and four per thousand person years or 0.2 and 0.4. That's a very low incidence rate. So when we had um, FTC TDF as our background incidence in the background, we would, we're generally seeing incidence rates that are 10 times that. It's what 90% effective means, right? But this is really difficult for a trial design when we have very, very low incidence rates, what would be expected if cabotegravir is being used. So if you're using an active control, the usual strategy is to design an active control non-inferiority trial. And the idea behind a non-inferiority trial is that you've, can, you've proven that the active control works in a prior placebo control trial. So you show that the active control had much lower incidence than the placebo. And then you take your active control into an um, you take your active control into a non-inferiority trial, and now you're expecting the experimental and the active control to have pretty similar rates. And you use what's called a non-inferiority margin as your basis of how similar they have to be to show that the active control is better than the placebo. So the assumptions you make when you do these active control trials and you're randomizing between active control and experimental is that the active control, as it worked in the placebo, works pretty much the same. This constancy assumption works pretty much the same in the new setting. And that the non-inferiority design uh, margin that you pick is defined to ensure that the effectiveness of the experimental compared to an imaginary placebo based on the prior trial. So that's the usual um, sort of approach to a non-inferiority trial. Now, let me show you the problem we have with cabotegravir preventing 90% of infections. And it's really a sample size problem. So to illustrate, when I designed or we designed the HPTN-083 trial, our goal was to establish that cabotegravir was non-inferior non to Truvada. And in that particular trial, we actually assumed that cabotegravir would work better than Truvada because the injection takes away the adherence, the the, the self-adherence to the pill. We also assumed that Truvada would be modestly effective. So, you know, coming down to the first line here, which is the actual HPT-083 trial size, we assumed that cabotegravir would be 25% more effective than Truvada because of the adherence advantage. We also assumed that on the FTC TDF arm, incidence would be about 2%, right? That resulted in a trial which had four and a half thousand people enrolled and assumed we would get close to 10,000 person years of follow up. Now, if I take that now with cabotegravir as our active and control, so I'm assuming then that the, act, the incidence rate on the cabotegravir uh, might be as high as one in a, um, as one in a hundred, which is you know one in a hundred or 0.5 in a hundred. Those are the two lines there. I can also not assume that any new trial is going to have a particular advantage above cabotegravir. So they're going to be equivalent. So if I carry on and do sort of the same design strategy that I used, that we used in 083, we're suddenly ending up, well, not suddenly, we're ending up with sample sizes that are on the 40,000 to 80,000 person. You know, that's how many people we would have to enroll. Now, most people, you know, 
for a non-inferiority strategy. Most people think that's not doable in HIV prevention. So instead we're proposing a new strategy, which is to use an active control trial with a placebo counterfactual. So it's based on the same kind of idea that we've proven that the active control works in a placebo controlled trial. We're gonna to continue to do a randomization to an intervention versus the active control. But it, the comparison is gonna be against this counterfactual placebo. It uses the same constancy assumption that the active control will work similarly in, uh, in, the, new, um, in the new setting. But we're also assuming that the expected infections on the active control are going to be too small for us to do a traditional non-inferiority trial. And that the decrease in infections compared to no protection for both the experimental and the active control is going to be very large. So there's a very large reduction. So then the question is, how the heck are we going to estimate this counterfactual placebo? How are we actually going to do this? So there are several strategies I'm going to go through, the things that are sort of under active research for how we would do this. So there are two fundamental strategies. One is to try and estimate directly what the incidence rate would be on placebo. And the second is to try and estimate the efficacy of the active control compared to the counterfactual placebo in the current setting. I'm actually going to only talk about the first four because um, they only gave me 20 minutes. <laughs> um, but the, I'd be happy to talk to you about the others if you want to come and talk to me about it. So um, let's step through these four potential possibilities. One is, can we use historical data for specific populations of the incidents we've seen in the past? So I'm showing you here a slide that was put together by Holly Jaynes about the HIV incidence estimates amongst female placebos in sub-Saharan Africa. So we've seen a relatively constant rate for quite a number of years. So since Truvada was approved, we've seen incidence rates that are sort of in the two to 4% range. Okay, so I have taken data like this, and I used this to estimate the efficacy of a cabotegravir directly. So I took placebo data from matching sites in 083, and I compared what the efficacy would have been against that historical placebo. And in this exercise that, I've, that I completed, you can see that the efficacy rate is pretty constant, even though I'm using three completely different trials, three different settings of um, incidents. Um, you get a very similar so it's a very similar efficacy estimate. So this is one possible thing that we could do. The major problem with this, of course, is that as we go on into the future, these historical trials are not going to reflect what's actually going on now in the country. So this is a dilemma for us because the historical data, for instance, is not going to be updated for current tasks and prep use. A second approach is to actually try and collect that incidence data concurrent with your trial. So um, this is a strategy that's being used in the PrEP back trial where they have a registrational cohort that the trial itself runs before they do the randomization. So I think this trial ha has completed the registrational cohort. It ran, I think, from 2018 to, oh, I'm going to get this wrong, 2018 to 2022, I think they completed the registration cohort. So they're enrolling people while they're waiting for the trial and the screening to go on. They enroll people who want to enroll in the future trial. And then they look at the HIV, they measure HIV incidence in that registrational cohort while waiting. Right? So th that is a strategy that's being used and it clearly stays contemporary. One challenge for this, of course, is that in that registrational waiting phase, there's going to be, we expect increasingly effective use of PrEP in the registrational trial. So in the era of cabotegravir, maybe the people are using cabotegravir in that registrational cohort. So it's not necessarily going to represent uh, placebo. Another strategy, um, which is a similar idea to the registrational cohort, is to use um, a counterfactual estimated using recency testing algorithm at screening. So the idea here is that the recency assay produces an estimate of incidence just prior in, in the period prior to people screening for the trial. So if we screen for a trial, when we, when we come across people who have already been infected with HIV, that we can test whether or not their, their, their infection is fairly recent and from that recency get an estimate of incidence in the cohort coming into the trial. Um, so, you know, these incidence assays are well established. However, a couple of difficulties I want you to really understand about how you would go about doing this. One is that when you're screening for the trial to get this incidence estimate right, 
you need to have a, you need to be screening a cohort of people having coming into your site that are representative of, of the eligible population who were uninfected two years ago. So anyone who found out about their infection in the last two years, you want in your screening population. So that's different from how we screen for trials normally, where we try to optimize for people who are HIV uninfected. A second issue I think that's coming up is because of frequent testing and early ART, viral suppression in people who've been infected in the last two years is kind of more common now. And the, H, the recency assay um, counts someone as not recent if they're, not, if they're virally suppressed. So this is another sort of adjustment we're gonna have to figure out how to, how to deal with it. The fourth thing I want, the idea that's around is estimating HIV incidence using a biomarker of HIV exposure. So as, as uh, Mike mentioned, STIs go along with HIV exposure. So one idea is, can we use a biomarker of sexual exposure because it's related with HIV exposure? And an, you know, one of the ideas that have been worked in here is rectal GC in, in MSM populations. That might be able to be, because of its high correlation with HIV infection, we might be able to use those infection rates during the trial as a marker of how much HIV exposure there is going on. Um, and there, there, is a, there is some statistical work that's been done to do this correlation between, to look at the correlation between STI rates and HIV rates and use that to try and estimate what the rate would have been if there was no HIV prevention going on as there is in the trial. Um, some of the problems of this is you know, the statistical precision of this meta-analysis approach is really, really rather challenging. It's hard to get precise estimates. I think the second thing that I'm aware of is we let good candidate biomarkers of, biomarkers, of biomarkers of exposure in women. So this type of relationship doesn't work as doesn't is not very strong in women. Um, so we're still at that problem. So I'm going to stop here. <laughs> um, Long-acting prep when it's readily available and widely used is going to create this challenge for assessing the prevention efficacy of new products. So efficacy estimates based on counterfactual placebo does offer a path forward. There is FDA guidance that's recently been released on consideration for design and conduct of externally controlled trials for drug and biological products. So we are reading that carefully. But I have to say there's careful thought and engagement with across the spectrum, with community, with clinical trialists, with regulators, with biostatisticians to try and figure out a good path forward for this. Um, that has been actively pursued in a project with the Forum for Collaborative Research. They've got this PrEP project that's been going on. Many of you may have been involved in conversations with that. But our common goal is to ensure a future with multiple highly effective, readily available and widely used biologics. And I challenge you to join with me in figuring out how to do this. <laughs> Thank you. So our next speaker giving a talk about pathways to epidemic control is Harriet. Oh, Harriet. I don't know how to say your last name. I'm really sorry, but no one prepared me for this. She's an assistant professor of epidemiology in Columbia University, Mailman School of Public Health. She spent the last 10 years as the research director of ICAP and Eswatini, overseeing clinical research projects. She is a principal, um, she's the head of the Eswatini Prevention Center and the principal investigator for HPT and O and a, a site principal investigator for HPT and 084. So she leads a lot of work in Eswatini, and I'm glad to hear, have you here. Um, thank you, Deborah, for the kind introduction, and good morning, everyone. Um, thank you to the organizers for asking me to speak at this meeting. And I'm really excited because as looking at the agenda, wanting to find out when is the time I can get into Cape Town and see the mountain. And as I was flying in, the mountain was there. So I've already toured Cape Town as well, and I'm really glad. Um, so, okay. Um, I've been asked in the next 20 minutes or so to speak about um, HIV, uh, uh, pathways to HIV and, and AIDS epidemic control. Um, and I actually thought 20 minutes to do this is a really tough, tough task. Um, 
given that there's an entire almost 200 page document from UNAIDS that was released recently, going through all the pathways and with an actual path on the, on the top of the cover. So there's a lot of material to cover, but I think I'll just go through a few things around population viral load suppression and maybe touch on HIV prevention um, as we think about what comes up in the future and what we do um, in the network perhaps and beyond. So with HIV epidemic control, what exactly are we trying to achieve? And there are many technical definitions of how we can define epidemic control, but I think at the very core is to um, aim at reducing new HIV infections and AIDS related deaths. For this talk, I'm gonna focus more on reduction in new HIV infections. And for that, you're looking at absolute HIV incidence um, that is under one in 10,000 adults and at, or a 90% reduction in the number of new infections by 2030. For a number of UNAIDS targets and global targets and national targets, we are looking at 2030 as the year that we end um, the epidemic or we meet our goals. So, in thinking about how this might happen, um, I thought I might build on to what Mike uh, did earlier to introduce the topic around U equals U, because when we are thinking about population viral load, viral load suppression, we are thinking about universal treatment, making sure treatment reaches everybody. Um, and at the same time, we want to be able to work on our prevention pieces as well. And there's many tool, tools in there, um, working towards zero um, new infections, of course, in the context of zero stigma, zero discrimination, zero rules um, that make it difficult for us to, to implement what we are doing. So a little bit about population viral load suppression. Um, UNAIDS guidance is that if we achieve the 95, 95, 95, we will get to, um, to, this, to this target. And what that means is that 95% of people living with HIV are aware of their HIV status. Of those, 95% are on treatment. And of those, 95% are virally suppressed. If you meet those targets, it means 86% of your population um, is virally suppressed. You can see right away that you would wish to exceed those targets so that more of your population is virally suppressed. And why is this a big deal? Um, I think there are many, many studies that relate to how well ART does with suppressing viral load. I'll just highlight this one because it's from HPTN. <laughs> and because it was also a landmark trial that sort of link, um, highlighted the minimal number of infections when ART was initiated early versus when ART was delayed. In fact, there were no linked infections when um, people living with HIV in this study that had serodiscordant um, couples, um, there were no linked infections when the person living with HIV was stably virally suppressed. Any infections that occurred were linked to high viral load, and there was a substantial number of unlinked HIV infection. So where HIV infection is coming, not from that, um, that couple. And I'll come back to that in a little while. So all this work has been recently summarized in this systematic review, more than 7,000 couples and about 300 transmission events, but all those transmission events not occurring when the person living with HIV is, is stably suppressed. And in fact, when the viral load is under 200, you really don't get any transmission events at all. So there's lots of work that shows us that with um, universal treatment, with viral load suppression, we can um, eliminate new infections. How is this playing out in the real world? Um, where I work at ICAP and together with uh, CDC and other partners, We've been working on a project called the Population HIV Impact Assessment Surveys, or FIA. Um, I think many of you would have heard of it in your various countries as UFIA in Uganda, MFIA in Malawi, ZIMFIA in Zimbabwe, and the like. And we've undertaken these surveys are now at least two, three times in a number of countries. What these surveys do is do conduct household uh, testing for HIV, um, take a sample for viral load suppression, and then we measure the 95 among individuals, uh, 95 indicators among individuals who are 15 years and older. 
And in this slide, um, the first set of bars are for surveys conducted in Zimbabwe, Lesotho, Uganda, Malawi, and Eswatini in 2015 to 2017. And you see right away there that um, the first set of bars, which is the first 95, the diagnosis, is a significant gap at that time. Um, the treatment was doing well at the time, but viral load suppression was still a challenge by then. These countries have had a second set of surveys repeated more recently in 2019 to 2021. And you do see that we are closing the gap with the first 95 um, indicator. Uh, we are meeting the targets with treatment and nearly there with viral load suppression. However, we know that the first 95 is critically important because if you don't know your status, you can't start treatment um, and neither can you um, get into the viral load suppression category. So how has this translated into population viral load suppression in these countries? You do see that between 2016 in the lighter bar and 2020 in the darker bar, um, that our population viral load suppression is increasing towards that target of 86%. Um, but for countries where some gaps remain, you do note that at about 20% of that uh, PLHIV population is potentially capable of HIV transmission. And um, here is a delve into Eswatini where um, we've had the, the privilege of doing these surveys three times in 2011, 2016, and 2021. And here you see our trend uh, with the first 95, the second 95, and the third 95 in the bars that, are, that don't have a red box. Um, you see that we have the same trend among adults who are 18 to 49. Um, in terms of increase in all the 95 indicators over time. Of course, in 2011, we didn't quite have the 95s the way we have them now. And so you see that our initiation of treatment was really um, low at the time. And with that, our population viral load suppression has increased over time, such that um, by a couple of 2021, we had already met that 86% population viral load suppression. And so then the question is, has this led to a decline in HIV incidence? This is HIV incidence from the same surveys in the same population with the uh, 18 to 49, with the males first, the first set of bars, the females and overall. And what you see immediately here is that for all, um, for both male and females and overall, HIV incidence is reducing over time. And that, is, that reduction is substantially more for um, the males than it is for the females. And I'm happy to take on what that means in, time, in the discussion um, section. So I looked at what UNAIDS is reporting in terms of what they have uh, from these fears as well as from their projections. And I wanted to know in the countries where we work, are we there yet? Um, like the kids usually ask in the car, are we, yet? are we there yet? Are we there yet? Um, so are we there yet with population viral load suppression? These are data from the UNAIDS update um, just recently released. And you see that the green, which is we are there, um, for, is for women who are 15 years and older. There's a lot more greens there. For the males who are 15 years uh, and older, a few greens, a few 90s showing up, some 80s, we are getting there, but not quite yet. And then they included data on children who were zero to 14. And you start to see 80s and 70s and even lower in that cascade. And I think we need to think what we are doing for our pediatric populations. Uh, 14 year olds will soon become 16, 17, 20. And we know what happens when they are a sexually active population. Are we there with, are we there yet with the decline in HIV, um, new HIV infections? These data are from the Global HIV Prevention Coalition, and they show that um, there is a number of countries that are making substantial progress where there's more than a 60% reduction in new infections. There are some countries that are making progress, and I hope when you look at the slide closely, you see where your country is. But there are countries where there is a concern that they are going in the wrong direction. And I think as we implement and as we observe successes in our work, we shouldn't take it for granted um, because if we didn't do what we were doing with um, uh, the public health programs, things can actually reverse and go the wrong direction. Let me speak a little bit about 
what's remaining, that implication of not quite reaching the last mile. And um, I think what, when I think about this, I think about what it takes to, to sustain transmission. And I think we have to be mindful that even if we've achieved the 95s, a few unsuppressed individuals can actually sustain transmission. Here is the 95, uh, 95, 95 data by age and sex in Eswatini where we've met these indicators. And when you look closely, sorry, this is the population viral load suppression. When you look closely at the males 25 to 34 and the females 15 to 24, you do see a substantial number, even if nationally we say we've met this target that um, are not virally suppressed. And what does that mean? I wanted to illustrate this with um, a study that we are just concluding on um, point of care STI testing. And I'm glad Mike brought up the issue of point of, of, of STIs and being you know, neighbors with HIV impact bed mates. Um, so we've just in Eswatini in this similar population 1849 concluded a study where we were trying to introduce point of care um, STI testing for chlamydia and gonorrhea, just two STIs. And our STI prevalence, these are outpatient clinic, was um, 22%. So one in five adults with an STI, just these two STIs. And then we asked this, um, uh, this was 55 people, and we asked these 55 people to list the number of partners they have. And you see um, in that table is the participants who listed one partner. So 32 people said, I have one partner. 12 people said, I have 24, uh, I, I have two partners. Um, th uh, 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 six people said, I have three partners. But look at the four people who said, I have three, I have four or more partners. Those four people potentially reach um, a, a substantial majority of the partners. In fact, 7% of the adults with STIs actually were linked to about 27% uh, of the partners. And when we asked, did you tell your partner that we've diagnosed you with an STI? Um, less than half of those partners had been informed. So I guess I, I'm trying to make the point that it really can take a very small minority, even if we think we've hit the big, you know, the low hanging fruit to sustain um, uh, transmission. So let me move quickly into trans um, prevention and I'll go really quick over this because I know it will be um, discussed a little bit more in. I think for population viral load suppression, we are seeing some successes, um, we are seeing some challenges. And I want to speak a little bit about what can we do to meet those gaps that we see uh, lurk with um, population viral load suppression. I think now more than ever, we have a huge array of um, HIV prevention interventions. Um, there's no need to really uh, go through them for this network. Everyone knows what they are. We are excited about what's already available in terms of treatment, um, oral prep, what's coming in the pipeline with the rings and the injectables and what's in development, as Mike alluded to. Um, but I think there's an ongoing unmet need for combination prevention. Let's start with the original uh, multipurpose technology, the condom. We know that it can prevent HIV, STIs, and pregnancy. We know that billions of condoms are distributed every year. But are they getting utilized? And if you recall the slide I showed about declining HIV incidence, let's focus a little bit on the young women, um, adolescent girls and young women. These data from UNAIDS show condom use at last sex among adolescent girls and young women with a non-regular partner. So this is someone who perhaps you're less familiar with and you'd think um, you'd want um, a condom used. The blue is West Africa, the orange is Eastern Southern Africa. And you see that less than half of these girls are reporting um, condom use. I actually had this slide for a Swatini as well. It looks very similar um, as well. So condoms not being used maximally. What about oral prep? What we've had for a little while, is it accessible? These data are for men and women from, uh, from Eswatini in the most recent FIA survey we've had. Um, the middle line, which is, I guess, uh, bluish turquoise, um, is people who's, who were HIV negative, who we asked, are you aware about PrEP? So around 30, 40% say we are aware of prep, we are aware of prep. So prep knowledge not being universal. The green line 
um, is those individuals who we asked, would you be willing to use it? So you see around two thirds saying, I would be willing to use it. Um, but the yellow line is people who were HIV negative that we asked, have you used it? And now you see that percentage getting into um, you know, the fives and the tens. So that access is really important. The other thing about oral prep, um, I was stunned when I saw this data at Croy earlier this year, and this is a pooled analysis on prep adherence among um, young women, around 6,000 young women. Um, just to summarize this slide, they took objective and subjective measures um, of taking oral prep. And objective measures would be testing blood. Subjective measures with, is when you count pills and you know, have some monitoring of, of the taking of these pills. What you want to see in that bar chart is you want to see more dark blues. You want to see that um, a, a substantial number of women are taking enough PrEP to protect them. So when you look at the objective set of uh, objective uh, measures, which is the first set of bars, um, you do see that that bar is really small. The next set of bars, which is the subjective measures, when we ask the women, we engage them, we cancel them, you see a, large, um, a larger uh, proportion saying they've been taking this medication and that's not playing out in terms of, um, of what we are finding in the blood. So I think we need to figure out how we ensure that these women are actually taking the PrEP. And it's important because on the other side where you have the HIV incidence, the green where HIV incidence is nearly zero is the women who have high PrEP up, um, uptake and adherence. And the red, um, which is an HIV incidence of 1.27 is where PrEP is being taken inconsistently. Enough about the women, what about the men? Um, we do have VMMC, it's very protective, it's very efficacious, but again, we are not going to scale with this intervention. I present here data from Eswatini in the bar chart where we have the light blue bar is uncircumcised male first among people who are living with HIV, you see 79% uncircumcised water under the bridge. The next bar, HIV negative, 50% uncircumcised. And these are people who've touched our health systems and been in for HIV testing that we haven't completed that activity. And then finally, there's the, the happy ones out there who are not tested, not circumcised, and clearly going about their way um, without, without any prevention of this nature. When you look more globally in Sub-Saharan Africa, in traditionally non-circumcising populations, um, the, the, curve, the chart is hard to see, but would want those colors to be a lot darker, so closer to universal coverage. And I think for many of our countries, you see a lot of bright, bright orange, which is less than ideal. So let me speak a little bit about the future and maybe what we can think about um, within the network. The first 95, I can't emphasize it enough. I think we need to think about expanding or enhancing our testing strategies, HIV self-testing, our DSD models, because we do know um, that when you have self-testing, you do increase uptake and you do increase coverage. We need to think about our youth. Many of our populations have a youth bulge. And when you look at the cascades of, um, of People who are younger, you start to see 40s and 60s, whereas earlier I mentioned 90s and 80s in the older populations. We need to think about our key populations. And this slide I found really fascinating from um, the Zimfia data, the blue bars, the general population, when a, a biobehavioral survey was conducted around the same time among key populations, you see such a substantial gap with HIV testing and with viral load suppression. I do think we also need to think about differentiate, differentiated service delivery models, both for prevention and treatment, and thinking about when, where, who, and what is delivering these in, uh, in delivering these interventions. Thinking about facility models, community models, group models, and individual models. And this is medication pickup. There is peer support, they reduce facility visits and do decongest our facilities um, in terms of, uh, of managing infections. And just in case you're wondering what the ambassador and our minister of health are smiling about, that's an, ele that's an electronic locker where participants uh, you know, 
patients get a cord and they can access at any time of day with that cord a locker and pick up their medication. Very easy to do. I think I'll keep the multipurpose technologies. It's gonna come up later um, and just speak a little bit about sustaining investments. Again, looking at our work here in Eswatini, we do need to keep um, investing more if we are going to meet those, um, those ending epidemic goals by 2030, mainly in injectable carb, in self-testing. And I think what we are hearing about defunding programs is not gonna work well um, in terms of meeting the epidemic. So in summary, um, our population viral load suppression and effective combination prevention are needed for epidemic control. I like this um, pillars listed in the pathway to um, HIV prevention in that roadmap that focuses on various key populations, as you see here. We need to be able to sustain the gains we've made and um, think about differentiated service delivery models, expand our prep options, and um, think about how we move this to scale in real world settings. And I think to conclude, there's a recent article, and I think Mike said this in his opening as well, we can tackle the virus, we have to invent, but where we are not inventing or where, as we invent, we need to reach more people with the existing technology. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here. Um, I'll need help with bringing up the slides and um, I'll introduce our next speaker who is um, Saka Mali, um, who is going to present about evolving the evolving prep landscape in the African region. Dr. Saka is the Director of Implementation Science at WITS in South Africa. She has supported oral prep introduction in South Africa since 2016 and is the PI of several tri trials um, evaluating integrated service delivery approaches to women. Um, Dr. Saka is a member of the Strategic Leadership Group of Mosaic, um, which will, we hope, catalyze um, introduction of PrEP in multiple countries. Welcome. Um, thank you very much, um, Harriet, your phone. Thanks very much. I'd like to thank the meeting organizers for inviting me to present. Um, as someone who's had the privilege of supporting oral PrEP implementation in South Africa and in other countries uh, more indirectly uh, across the continent since 2016, um, in preparation for this talk, it was good to reflect on achievements and successes, as well as the road that we still have ahead of us in improving access to PrEP. Um, in terms of key takeaways, uh, just to go through these very quickly, East and Southern Africa bear the highest burden of HIV. Although HIV incidence is declining, adolescent girls and young women and key populations are disproportionately uh, affected. Oral PrEP's been rolled out and uptake has been highest in the Africa region, but below targets. So, and the high uptake has been due to many factors, including better coordination, availability of implementation tools and resources, understanding, the value chain for product introduction and the implementation of many differentiated service delivery models. But we now have new long acting PrEP methods. We have the Depivirin ring and long acting cabotegravir approved in several countries in, in Africa. And many demonstration studies are planned and underway, some of which are large real world demonstration projects. Um, however, we still have some challenges ahead of us, and I'll hope to go into some of those uh, towards the end of my talk. So Harriet spoke about the, uh, the um, HIV epidemic. Um, so just to reiterate that East and Southern Africa bear a high burden of HIV, but while we've made significant strides in reducing overall HIV incidence on the continent, the burden of the epidemic continues to weigh disproportionately on adolescent girls and young women, as well as key populations. 
And in our region, women and girls 15 to 49 make up 24% of the population, but account for 52% of new infections. So we need focused efforts to scale up prevention for adolescents um, and young women. So since 2015, when WHO recommended oral PrEP for populations that would benefit, oral PrEP uptake has increased exponentially, uh, particularly in East and Southern Africa. So Africa has done better than other regions in terms of oral PrEP uptake, but we still have a way to go to reach the 2025 PrEP targets. And if we look at this picture globally, Total PrEP initiations were just under 5 million with strong increases last year. And in Africa though, we can see that uptake has been varied across the continent with some countries driving the overall performance. So some countries have done well and eight countries in sub, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa have surpassed the 100,000 PrEP initiation level accounting for over 90% of initiations in the region. And South Africa and Kenya were two of the earliest adopters with national programs scaling up over time. And Zambia, Uganda, and Nigeria have also seen significant growth since 2021. So for the next few slides, I'm gonna focus on some of the factors that have enabled this growth. And one of these is strengthened global and regional coordination. And this has happened through mechanisms like uh, the Options Consortium, which built a catalytic platform for oral PrEP introduction and focused on South Africa, Zimbabwe, and Kenya initially. Um, two more current mechanisms like Mosaic, which is focused on accelerating access to PrEP choice in over 10 countries in the region. Uh, the Matrix uh, project, which is focused on bringing new products to market, as well as initiatives like Biopic, focused on research coordination for long-acting hepatagravir, and the recently formed Coalition to Accelerate Access to Long-Acting PrEP, and that brings together key global stakeholders um, and was announced at the last um, IAS meeting. But most importantly, we've also seen strong government-led country coordination in several African countries. And this is an example from South Africa where government-led coordination brought together multiple partners doing different things under the auspices of a national technical working group. And this avoided duplication, it identified synergies, optimized resources, and here's the collaborative framework for PrEP uh, led by the National Department of Health, which includes all partners working together on a shared agenda. Secondly, through oral PrEP introduction, countries have also developed a clear path from research to national implementation at scale and have adopted a value chain approach for identifying actions as well as research associated with introducing and scaling up PrEP methods. So for a new product to be introduced, we need planning and budgeting. We need guidelines in place. We need to make sure product is available and distributed in sufficient quantities to meet demand through prioritized service delivery channels. We need trained healthcare providers delivering a quality service to all who need it through delivery platforms that effectively reach users. And we need to have communities and end users that understand the product and are able to seek out and effectively use products. And we need to make sure that these products are integrated into national systems and monitored. In addition to coordination at various levels and a better understanding of, of the value chain for introduction, um, there's also been a wealth of global implementation tools and resources developed to support PrEP introduction. And this slide is an example from the Mosaic Consortium, and it represents some of the tools available across the value chain. So these include PrEP guideline templates, um, HIV uh, prevention ambassadors training, 
um, and a, a wealth of other tools and resources that are actually in the public uh, domain. And, and here are just some examples which include uh, for South Africa, for example, the MyPrep online resources, various IEC materials, job aids for healthcare providers, um, the PREPIT tool, which is a tool to assist with governments with planning, um, as well as uh, provider training for various cadres. Since we began implementing oral PREP services and continued to do so through the COVID pandemic, Many differentiated service delivery models have also been implemented across the continent, from service delivery in fixed healthcare facilities to decentralized models providing services at mobile clinics, community hotspots, gazebos, private pharmacies, delivery at community based organizations, schools, institutions of higher learning. And we've actually also used social media and online platforms uh, and digital tools to provide information and link people to service. And many programs and implementers have also really strengthened focus on engaging with communities. Um, and here you can see some examples of uh, various activities in communities with, uh, with young people. So a lot has been achieved, but we know that oral prep is not for everyone for a range of reasons related to lifestyle, side effects, product characteristics. So we need a multi-method market. And the good news is that we now have two new products, the Depivirin ring and the long-acting cabotegravir, which have been approved in several African countries with other products potentially available for introduction over the next few years. And this slide, I know it's quite busy, but it summarizes information on the approval status for both ring and long acting habitegravir in the region. And these two new methods are going to be introduced through implementation science studies initially, and um, some through PEPFRA procurement, through the uh, PEPFAR country operational plan um, and implemented by uh, PEPFAR implementing partners. We're going to see this table change over the coming months, but what you can see is that there's quite a number of countries with approvals and plans for implementation research um, and as well as implementation through the COP. So, in terms of better coordination, it's been not only the implementation, but also research coordination that's been significantly strengthened. Um, and of the 36 um, studies planned globally, uh, and both planned and ongoing, 23 are taking place in Africa, some in more than one country. And here you can see the spread of these studies, and you can see there's a large number um, in South Africa. And these studies represent a culmination of multi-country and multidisciplinary scientific collaboration um, and a belief in the, the value of having choice in prevention. Here are the study populations that have been included in these studies um, with cisgender women, adolescent girls and young women, and pregnant and lactating people reasonably well represented. Um, trans and gender non-conforming people less well represented, and no studies planned for people who use drugs or prisoners. When oral PrEP initially was recommended, there was only a handful of small demonstration studies, um, and some of which were not implemented in real world settings. So for new methods, we're now seeing that the, impl the, the implementation of larger studies in real world settings. And currently there are five studies with sample sizes over 5,000 participants. Um, and these include the Catalyst multi-country study, um, Project PrEP, um, Fast PrEP, Tetanami in South Africa, um, and the Path to Scale study in Malawi. And most of these studies plan to run from 2023 to 2025 but these timelines could be influenced by approvals and cab supply. 
And here's just a slide to show you the landscape of CAB prep introduction. And um, a lot of these slides are, are changing. This is quite a, a quickly evolving space. Um, highlighting countries that will be receiving CAB for studies, um, as well as potentially through the PEPFAR COP allocation. So I'm going to highlight very briefly uh, the largest of these uh, implementation studies, uh, the Catalyst study, and um, it's conducted under Mosaic, which is a USAID funded uh, mechanism led by FHI 360. Um, and this is underway in five countries, Kenya, Lesotho, South Africa, Zimbabwe, and Uganda. And it's a prospective implementation science study looking to characterize implementation of an enhanced service delivery package for PrEP choice. Remember, our healthcare providers are now uh, going to have to be trained to provide PrEP choice. Um, describe patterns of PrEP use and effectiveness in the context of PrEP choice, and also look at clinically relevant indicators amongst um, PrEP users. And the study is designed to function as a learning lab for new product introduction, and lessons are going to be shared with other countries in the region, in other regions, as well as globally through a detailed uh, research utilization plan. Um, there's value in uh, this coordination at the global level, but we found um, that it's been um, uh, it's been very valuable to do a much more detailed mapping um, at the country level as well. And so here's an example from South Africa, where a lot of the studies um, were being conduct uh, are being conducted um, under the auspices of the National Technical Working Group. And we were asked to investigate which questions will or won't be addressed by the current slate of planned or ongoing projects, provide an understanding of when insights were going to become available. Um, and this slide shows the studies, their geographic spread, and the types of settings where studies are taking place. And currently we have a spread across all nine provinces and 18 districts, representing a mix of urban, peri-urban, and rural um, uh, rural settings. Um, there is a much more detailed mapping if anyone's interested. The full mapping included populations, service delivery models, and details of questions to be answered, um, as well as sub-studies. Um, however, this slide shows the anticipated coverage of priority research questions which were identified through the National technical working group. And I won't go into these because my time is up, but I want to um, go to my last slide, which is about remaining challenges. And some of these have been spoken about this morning. Although we've made considerable strides in terms of oral prep rollout in the region, the full potential of oral prep hasn't yet been realized. And we have the potential to improve even in countries where oral uptake, um, uh, prep uptake has been better. We still have stigma and laws impeding access for all, um, and these are significant barriers in certain settings. We've seen delayed access and limited choice for pregnant and lactating people. People under 18 still have limited choices because of regulatory barriers. Um, and many programs and trials have documented that the need for PrEP coexists with an enormous burden of STIs and contraceptive need. Also, all our current PrEP choices are ARV based, which leads to complex scheduling. It means in our setting, initiation is being limited to certain health cadres and concerns around testing and HIV drug resistance. So, and I'm going to end with the most significant barrier, um, and it was good to see that there will be some work addressing cost. Um, high prices of existing choices may make them unaffordable for governments and donors and will have the that will limit their potential impact and we can't have countries in which trials are being conducted being unable to afford access for the very populations that have participated in the trials so as we tackle the challenges ahead um I think it's important to reflect on the significance of our of our collective efforts and our shared resolve to bridge these gaps. The road ahead of us is long, 
but the destination I think is one of profound significance, a world where HIV prevention choices are not confined to theoretical, but firmly embedded in the fabric of real world settings. Thank you. And oops, talking to this. Um, I'd like to um, introduce our next speaker, Nirupa Masista. Dr. Rim Nirupa Masista is Executive Director of the HPTN Leadership and Operations Center in Durham, North Carolina, and she leads the development and implementation of all ongoing HPTN research studies. She's part of the HPTN Leadership and member of the HPTN's executive committee. And Dr. Sister is also the director of research and development at FHI 360, with over 20 years of experience in the academic, pharmaceutical, and nonprofit sectors. Over to you. Thank you. And good morning, everyone. I'm going to try to go through this quickly so that uh, we will have time for questions and answers. Today, I am going to talk about focus areas of research that have been prioritized by the HPTN and the leadership for um, future science generation. But before I do that, I wanted to remind everyone about what our primary four pillars are for the scientific agenda and what our scientific aims are. Um, I think you all know this by now, but novel, identifying novel um, antiretroviral agents, as well as new formulations for HIV prevention, developing multipurpose technologies, we've talked about it this morning, evaluating broadly neutralizing antibodies. Mike has um, given us a, a very good introduction, and this will be in collaboration with our sister network, HVTN. And then finally, uh, designing integrated strategy studies where we would combine proven biomedical, social, behavioral, and structural interventions for looking at effectiveness at the population level. So in June of this year, the Executive Committee of HPTN and the scientific committees led by the chairs um, discussed the various research areas that should be prioritized in alignment of our scientific aims. And as you will see in the next few slides, many of them are going to be tackled in our breakout sessions. So STI and HIV, Mike's already made the case, so in the interest of time, I won't go through it. Um, broadly neutralizing antibodies, we, there's a lot of gaps still. We need to identify the right antibodies the right dose of those antibodies, the right combination. So we are not going to have a breakout session for that. Um, there is work going on, as he said, in the morning. Choice. Choice remains an integral part of HIV prevention. Uh, choice of effective prevention interventions. And the gaps still remain to identify tools to uh, optimize methods for increased PrEP uptake and persistence particularly in uh, key populations such as adolescents, young people, pregnant women. And there's a breakout session today for that as well. So we will have STI and HIV as well as the, the up, in, increased uptake or how to increase uptake of PrEP. Treatment as prevention. HPTN052 was a study that demonstrated treatment as prevention. But we still have many gaps with respect to status neutral approaches in many populations. Uh, certainly, we've done some studies in people who inject uh, drugs. HPT 074 was one of those that was conducted in Asia and Ukraine. Uh, at the community level, we had HPT 071, but there could be follow on studies um, based on those results that could address status neutral approaches. I think Saika spoke a lot about implementation and certainly trying to decentralize PrEP uptake, take it out of the clinic and into a, uh, avenues for healthy young individuals is a gap. And when we discuss this afternoon about increasing uptake, that could be a gap we could, be, uh, we could also address. 
We are currently doing studies in people who inject drugs in the United States. Um, Mike mentioned HPTN 094, where through mobile vans, we are delivering MOUD and PrEP and treatment in a status neutral approach. We're also going to evaluate injectable lenacapavir in people who inject drugs in the US. But the gap remains to um, again address status neutral approaches for both substance use treatment as well as PrEP and tre um, ARV treatment in pe people who use drugs uh, internationally in the global setting. Studies in pregnant women, the HPTN 084 OLA study is evaluating injectable cabalave, the safety, the pharmacology um, in pregnant women and infants, but the HPTN le leadership remains committed to doing more studies in pregnant women for HIV prevention. And finally, we conducted a study trying to recruit and retain MSM in Africa. That was the HPTN 075 that was successfully completed. And again, a gap remains to look at status neutral approaches in MSM and transgender people in Sub-Saharan Africa. So I just wanted to quickly say that these priority areas were identified based on input from the scientific committees and were in alignment with our aims. I think uh, the moderators of these breakout sessions wanted us to also remind uh, everyone some of the concepts that were not prioritized or ideas that were not prioritized. And those were really uh, concepts that may be addressing societal issues. I don't think HPTN has the funding to um, address gender equity or poverty or how, any interventions that cannot be sustainable outside of a research study. Ideas that were unfocused or just duplicated in other populations without clear justification of whether the outcomes are going to be different or is because the prevalence being high. And then, our HPTN uh, RF mandate, I would say, was more to look at systemic agents for both uh, PrEP and treatment as prevention um, and not so much topical agents. That said, as Mike mentioned, may have mentioned, uh, we are conducting a study with a rectal microbicide in the United States and some countries in Latin America, uh, HPTN 106. And at this time, we would wait for those results before considering other um, microbicides. And then finally, um, Saika mentioned matrix. And there are a few agents that are going to be first in human trials for new agents. And HPTN is very interested in conducting follow-on studies of uh, potentially new and exciting agents in phase two and three studies. So the next set of uh, slides really is going to talk about the status of these biomedical agents. Again, it's made my life easier because Saika has explained a lot about what's going on in the implementation field, um, but really what the current HPTN studies are evaluating, timelines for drug availability, and these are pure speculation on my part. Many in the audience probably know more about it, and we hope that you can inform the breakout sessions. Um, and then of course, planning for what comes next. And I hope that that would set the stage for the breakouts this afternoon. And so again, on this slide, we have the injectable cabalet, injectable lenacapavir, um, a multipurpose technology study, the DPP that has been mentioned and the rectal microbicide. What you don't have here are the BNABs, as I mentioned, um, they're still early in development looking at safety and tolerability. So with CAB, and this is again a continuously evolving slide set, um, there are approvals in many countries and submissions for approval in others. I just heard that it's also approved in Peru, so that's already an outdated slide. Um, there are direct discussions going on with many donors and procurers and with the Global PrEP Coalition for making this agent available and affordable. And uh, generic manufacturing with uh, the medicines patent pool, uh, they have now announced licensing with three generic manufacturers. So again, pure speculation that Cabalet may be available for programmatic rollout in maybe second quarter or third quarter of 2024, and we may be uh, seeing a generic version by end of 25. 
injectable lidocapa is still being evaluated for its efficacy. So it's earlier in the development and purpose one and two are being conducted to demonstrate efficacy. So at the be at best, I think, and again, others here might know the timing, um, the results may be available around 25, 2025 with approvals in 2026. The piverine ring, um, you all have seen the data from these uh, the pivotal studies. Um, as I mentioned, they are now getting rolled out. The ring is getting rolled out. Um, I think PEPFAR has supported procurement for research, not necessarily for programmatic rollout, but I believe the global fund is supporting programmatic rollout. And so that may be available for um, integrated strategy studies sometime next year. DPP, there are several uh, multipurpose technologies that are in um, development. The DPP uh, pill that Harriet and Mike mentioned is a product by Beatrice that HPTN is doing. We hope that the pivotal bioequivalence study will be completed next year. And um, alongside that, HPTN 104 is also being uh, developed and sent to the IRBs for approval and implemented. Earlier in development is another DPP that Pop Council and um, Medicines 360 is developing. We, they're still looking for a, a prototype manufacturer, so it's clearly earlier in development. And then a very interesting product, injectable Cabalé with um, Livinogestrol is being evaluated by Conrad through the Matrix Consortium. And we hope that their first in human studies will be done next year and maybe into 2025. And we are certainly interested then in that product for uh, phase two and other studies. So what next? Um, again, there are many of the speakers have talked about the research gaps. I won't go through them. Uh, again, using special populations, perhaps new agents. Some of you may know of them that we don't. Um, and when you consider integrated strategy studies, to consider when we get the registrational approval, but when actually those drugs are going to be available in whether through research studies or actually in the field and the populations that will benefit from the most um, appropriate integrated strategy. So the next slide actually just is a snapshot of the timing. Um, some of it might be in alignment, I hope it's like us presentation. Um, but again, just for us to set the stage of where all these products are, um, either to be available in the field or still in development where they could be approved. So the CAB LA, we hope, will be available next year um, for programmatic rollout and maybe a generic version available early to mid-2025 or later. Injectable and a cap aware, as I said, we are still early in development with um, approvals even not until 2026. Um, some of the DPP products are uh, somewhere in the 25, 26 timeframe that may be available some later. Uh, the ring is likely to be available sooner. And then uh, the rectal microbicide is again, very early in development is in, in phase one right now. Again, on this slide, we don't have the BNABs and we anticipate after the phase one studies, and I think there'll be more than one of those. Um, and the results sometime in 25 or 26, there might be a larger study. And only after that could we consider those for integrated strategies. I'm going to just acknowledge the many people that helped me with this presentation. And of course, our funders without whom nothing gets done. And I'll thank you for your attention. Uh, uh, well, let, let me say, first of all, those were all really, uh, really great talks, exceptionally good, to be perfectly honest. And I want all your slides. So that's, that's very, really good talks. Um, we have just a few, we're, we're not running that late. We have a few minutes for questions. I know it's really hard for people to go to the microphone and either make comments or questions. So, but somebody might have the courage or uh, inquisitive. So questions, okay. Your Cameron, where are you pointing? Oh, okay. So is there anyone with the courage to ask a question? It cannot be that there are no questions. 
so I shall ask a question. I shall ask a, I shall ask Carrie a question. Um, so one of the things that, that we talk about endlessly, a really terrific job about treatment as prevention, 95, 95, 95. My question has to do with uh, acute infection. This, this, you, you really emphasized how few people it takes to keep sustaining the epidemic. But in that universe, the thing we cannot deal with are people who are not tested, do not do they're infected, have the highest viral loads. And we've been struggling with this forever. Uh, you might have some brilliant idea uh, about what we should do. So here it is. What do we do about this? We take multiple questions. Okay. <laughs> thank, thank you, Mike. Um, acute infection. Acute infection, yes. Um, thank you. I, I don't know that we have a magic bullet around acute infection. I think the best thing might be that at any interaction in any setting um, with, a, with a person who's running a fever or you know has something infectious that we take the opportunity to conduct an HIV test. Um, but if it's acute infection, you're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna pick up anything. The best we have at the moment is the recency testing um, with the lag avidity. That's the closest we have to picking up recent infections. Um, but that's not clinically actionable. We're just using it for surveillance. Um, so I'm afraid you've given me a really tough one to respond to. Um, but I think that the, the best we can do is really engage folks on their history, their history of exposure, and maybe just have a high index of suspicion. And maybe the lab core might be able to say what more we can do in terms of early diagnostics. So this Thank is you. something to think of. David, David, you want to comment? No, David, you I'm want, just you have a different, different, different question. Yeah. Okay, so one thing I would say for the people who are here, think about the fact that, and this has gone on, Harry, that was an unfair question, because this has gone on for 30 years. It's like people show up, their rapid tests are negative or indeterminate, they may or may not have any symptoms, and but we put them back out into the community, and, and, and a large number of infections can surface from a single infection. I think Many estimates have been that 30% of all infections, roughly, can come from people who are acutely infected with unrecognized acute infections. So as we think about this, this is a big problem with everything we do with treatment as prevention. David, your, your turn. Yes, I have two questions, one for Deborah and one for Saika. Uh, thank you very much, Deborah, for your presentation. I'm gonna employ, I mean, try to ask you whether the counterfactual placebos uh, you talked of cross-sectional studies in people who are participating as they come in to participate. But I'm wondering whether you should also consider, uh, for example, in a study like HPTN, we could easily have used uh, antenatal uh, women, antenatal women who are coming in. In fact, you could actually use it progressively right. uh, over time. I think that could be a very good population to use. Uh, using cross-section as a, uh, for your consideration. Uh, for Saika, I'm a little bit worried about uh, PrEP, especially when you tend to use it in high-risk population. That's where you have very high incidence. But we, at the moment, the protocols do not, you did not require us to screen for HIV infection before we start. And what are your thoughts, you know, as we scale up uh, the issues of starting people who are already infected uh, for PrEP in the early phase? And, uh, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Thank you. So a good question. So, Saki, do you want to go first, then, Deborah? Sure. Um, so uh, the protocols do actually require HIV testing um, in many of the countries, certainly in South Africa and in the countries, you, you have to have an HIV test before you're offered PrEP. Um, but in terms of acute HIV infection, where also there are lots of countries that are currently training providers to do a better job of the acute HIV infection screening. So, so it's, country, it's country specific. It's country specific because right. we don't do it. So, for example, even in those countries that do it early, you see, it's very easy to miss, especially in very high incidence population, to miss the infection right. yeah. in the acute phase. And so, I'm wondering whether you think it's worth doing a monitoring, a random sampling of those people. And I know it's very difficult to actually ask, you know, confirm infection when 
you have started already in prayer. But yeah. I think that's yeah. a growing concern that we need to think and about. And it's a growing concern, particularly as we're preparing for CAB introduction as well, because there's, you know, with the current tests that we have, and in many of our settings, um, it's not fourth generation rapid tests. Right. Many countries have moved to a, um, sort of a three test algorithm for uh, for treatment, but um, we are um, currently sort of uh, looking at, and in fact, the catalyst study will be looking at what might be the most optimal testing strategies so that we miss fewer infections. Gotcha. So the, the, the tension here is the greater good. Do you start people on a drug that could lead to resistance, whether it's cabotegravir or oral prep? Or do you test them at the exp at the physical expense of the testing, the potential delay, and and all the other tensions? And I know Rafe, maybe this will come up over the course of the meeting. But Rafe, if you could talk about this tension in the United States, because in the U.S. we have make it even worse. It's PCR testing is required. So I think that's a really great question, David, and and we should continue to discuss it over the course. Maybe have a position. Um, Deborah, do you want to do you want to respond? David had a very good idea, actually. So, David, I love your answer because it may, means that I was successful in getting you to think about <laughs> what are the ways we can get HIV incidents. <laughs> so, yes, if there are other sources in country where we could possibly get information about what the underlying HIV incidence rate would be in the in the country. Um, I think those are all things that we should consider and I should we should all put our thinking hats on about that. Sometimes it's hard to actually get an incidence measure because you know it, it has the, these complexities. You have you do have to worry about how much prep use there is in that population because hopefully if they're in care, there's a lot. <laughs> and I, I think the other thing is you, you also have to kind of um, do this matching of the population you're enrolling in the trial and the population you're doing. So so it's it's still complex, but I think. Um, thinking about other ways within our own countries and our own settings, we know what the HIV incidence is in people who are not in trials is a useful conversation to have. So, because not everybody knows, I, I don't know you. So, so well, please say who you are, where you're from, and then ask a question. Oh, okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Nombe Kumbongo. I'm from Imabun Genocide, TTHC. Uh, I've got one question and a comment. Uh, the question is uh, for you, Sis Harit. Uh, from the slide that you show, like the diagnosis and those on treatment and virus suppressed, it's been interesting to see that um, comparing those who are on treatment to those who are viral suppressed, the number of the participants with viral suppression is lower than those that are taking treatment. And the question is like, uh, for me, it raises alarm from the community perspective because like, uh, I'm like now wondering, uh, is there anything that has been done to make sure that they are kept, like uh, that they, they, they are made to be suppressed at the end of the day? Number two, um, was it the time of the testing from the time of taking treatment that has caused like uh, the, significant like show that they are not suppressed and if it's the treatment or not the people what is it in terms of behavioral component of HIV prevention that has been done uh in those uh participants and the comment is wait, wait leave your comment let, let her harry you're gonna <laughs> leave your comment like your question is a really good question so she's emphasizing the gap yes that you showed the gaps and she wants you to tell her how in Aswatini you're dealing with the gap. Did you... Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you, Mage, for the question. Um, okay. <laughs> thank, thank you, Mage, for the question. Um, so. Wait, wait, wait. wait. What? Is okay. it me speaking? Or... <laughs> right. Sorry, here. Go on. Go on here. Uh, thank you, Mage, for the question. So I think the quick answer might be to find you during the break because we've done. <laughs> 
We've done 15 FIAs several times, 15 countries several times in multiple countries with the FIAs. And sometimes we present the data as um, conditional percentages and sometimes we don't. So I wanna be clear that I understand which slide you're talking to, but just about the gaps, it's really about um, you know how well people take their treatment, um, whether they stay on treatment, the adherence, as well as whether there might be factors that might take them off treatment. We've recently just finished a drug resistance survey so we have yet to see uh, how much drug resistance weighs into that. Um, in the fears, we don't have sufficient data to speak about resistance and its role in not achieving viral load suppression. So I'm happy to speak a little bit more and understand so, the question in the break. Thank it's you. a really you're, a lot of your work is cross-sectional too, so you yes. don't really have access. Yeah. She can so she sees these phenomena, but she doesn't know the individual who's necessarily not suppressed. You know the plucking out but that's a really good question your comment now the comment is i am praying for a world where we change the word subject when referring to the participants to the participants thank you yeah no that's a good and i will we'll try you know it's very hard let me say one thing we will try and do it at the court anyone who's used the word subject including me it's not out of rudeness it's that we're old we've been doing this so long it's so hard to change language like so i i, I agree completely with your comment and we'll try and use uh participant and if anyone says the word subject we'll assume you meant participant so that no one's gonna i don't want everybody to feel guilty because it's very hard for brains to change language so um yes Good morning all. Uh, thank you. Uh, Identify. Uh -uh. My name is Felix. I'm from Spillhouse, Harare, Zimbabwe. Welcome. Um, I would like to appreciate Deborah for Statistics 101 for explanation. <laughs> my question might actually appear very simple to you, but I, I like the way you parceled out the placebo counterfactual and the various arms, the Rita. Is there a possibility that you can get a more robust point estimate by combining all these four arms that you describe, or it's not something that is possible within the logistics of doing this. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I can tell you there is a trial that's been done by Gilead at the moment uh, where they are using a counterfactual approach. And yes, they are de-risking their approach by doing all of the above. So yes, they're doing a recency assay. They are also monitoring HIV incidents by other sort of um, data, by historical data and by uh, potentially other um, activities that are going on in the community that let them do that. So I, I do think, and they're also tracking SDIs. So I, um, most regulatory authorities do ask you or tell you, you have to pick one as the primary, but I think there is there's certainly um, the idea that you would do it in multiple ways and monitor multiple things to buttress your case, I think is um, is a very good suggestion that's, that most people would yeah, probably De Deborah, do. One, one problem, I have quite, it's a comment, and that is, I understand why, and, and the FDA has allowed two companies to proceed. They've allowed Gilead to proceed, as you just pointed out, in a very complicated way with lenacapavir. And they've allowed um, Gilead to proceed, one company, Gilead to proceed with F, uh, FTAF um, in women using this. But the FDA ever approve a drug using this method. So on the one, and the FDA is not the easiest agency. So on the one hand, they're encouraging, hey, why don't you do this? On the other hand, we have yet to see them say, we believe you to the extent that we're going to we're going to approve your drug in the United States for what that's worth, and the main champion of this activity in the FDA has left the FDA. So, so uh, I, I think my curiosity, and I don't know, you may not want to comment. It's just a comment. We have to see if is the FDA really going to approve FTF in women? That would be the first using a counterfactual. That would be a revolutionary moment, and it may or may not occur. Uh, uh, Nero, you had a comment or a question? I'm sorry. Okay, please identify yourself. Thank you. Uh, morning, everyone. My name is Elizabeth uh, from Harare, Zimbabwe. I'm a community educator. Uh, my question is directed to Deborah. You indicated that uh, when PrEP is readily available and used effectively, this will uh, create a challenge for assessing prevention efficacy for new uh, investigational uh, uh, study products. So, basing on this forecast, what impact? is PrEP currently imposing on HIV vaccine trials 
among us to those countries where PrEP is available, accessible, and uptake is significantly high. So is there any an ongoing assessment being carried out on this challenge that is PrEP use versus HIV vaccine efforts? Maybe in summary, uh, are, are there HIV vaccine trial, uh, trials being complicated now by the availability of PrEP? That's uh, my question. That's, that's a great question. I'm Thank not, you. I'm not, there's no, and, and um, I'm trying to make sure there's no one. Is, is who here? Right here. Are you, uh, okay, let me, let me explain. This is Hoob. Hoob, say hello. Hi. Hoob is representing the VTN at this meeting. And the challenge that was just raised is a giant challenge. So, so I could answer for who, but I'll let who answer for who. Can you repeat the question? Because I was so the, the question that. was, she's asking about the ethical, and Deborah may also, I'm not trying to take you out of this argument. The ethical challenge, and most of us are very concerned that we'll never do another placebo control trial, okay? That it's going to be just not right because there's something to give to people. Now, as our speaker said, PrEP is widely used and a tremendous energy in getting more PrEP used. Along come you with a vaccine you'd like to test in a setting where 50% of people, where everyone needs PrEP who would participate in the vaccine trial. How are you going to do a vaccine trial? How are you going to scale it and power it um, when everyone's using PrEP? Um, let's assume everyone's using PrEP. That's really the question. I mean, it may be too tough even for you. It's, that's a tough question. <laughs> we'll be here until tomorrow uh, discussing about it. So I think I, I actually would like to table that for, for another uh, time. Wait, before you leave that, so let me just say this. That yeah, I mean, I, was, I think, you know, putting Uber on the spot is, is hard. I, I, I think, you know, in all honesty, we don't have a strategy for moving vaccines forward with, with if, you know, if cabotegravir was available to every person in South Africa, it's very hard to know how we would move forward with a vaccine trial. I think, I think that is our current dilemma. But Linda, is, did you want to yeah. address this too? Because you say you have a different question or do you want to, you're into the same issue. Do you want to talk about that issue or something else? Something, something else. else. Okay. Uh, so let me say that was a great question, by the way. And we, we in fact, try not to talk about it because we don't know the answer. So honestly, you think I'm kidding? Who you you had a question or a comment? Yeah, my, my I sort of have a comment and a question. You know, we we're sort of entering this this phase where where a few people and probably people with acute HIV infection and very high high viral loads are driving the the sort of the continuous um, the continuation of the epidemic. And one of our our gaps is diagnostics. We don't have the right diagnostics in place. We have gene experts all over Africa, but they're in place for, for tuberculosis diagnostics. There's a very good HIV test on the gene expert, and there's data from Kenya where, when 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 people present with fever at at a um, at a hospital, the chances that they have in Kenya, and this is data from from uh, Edward Sanders when he was at IAPI, the chances that people have malaria are actually the same as that. People, right. A lot of those people actually right. have acute HIV infection. Right. So what we need is not just the antibody testing for HIV infection. We need RNA testing and we probably need better antigen tests. So we need to talk to the diagnostics manufacturers and the funders about how we're going to yeah. deal with that gap. And for COVID, there are similar. So diagnostics is a problem for all diseases. If we don't have diagnostics, we're flying blind. So that's that's sort of a topic right. we need to address. That's a, no, it's a very good, great comment. And um, that paper of malaria and HIV was a very famous uh, observation. So great comment. So we need to deal with acute HIV one way or the other. And your point is start at the beginning with diagnostics. I will say 20 years ago, probably 20 years ago, we showed a woman named Kim Powers in the Malawi group showed that if you have two discordant rapid tests and fever, your probability of having HIV was very high with discord and rapid tests. And I can, I can go into more detail, but great comment. Linda Gale, and the last question, then we have to break. Yeah, and thanks, Mike. And maybe just pick up on that, that that's perhaps going to be really important when we roll out CAB um, LA. And that brings me to the point that I want to, I'm afraid, just sort of create a little bit of discomfort amongst us. I was at an ethics committee um, meeting a, a week ago 
And I was challenged as a researcher what I have done around access to products and do why do I do research when I have questions about access to products and my response was that you know as an as a researcher my job is to find the best innovation available that is relevant to the populations that I care most about and for that reason I still stand very strongly that we did Cabalet studies in this part of the world by the way, entitled HPTN 083 and HPTN 084. But as a researcher, I really feel very strongly I have a responsibility to make sure that the end game is met and we do have access to capital. Yeah. And so I'm putting it to the leadership of the PTN. What are we doing about this? Um, you know, I think Psyche gave a beautiful talk. She ended on the question of cost and access. She didn't actually really unpack just how difficult it is to even do the implementation studies, which are pitiful in terms of what we need and what we're getting. And I just want to create a little bit of outrage in this community because there is nobody else who's going to take this up. We don't have a tack for prevention who can go out and say they won't take it until everybody has access to it. We need more activism, I think we need to make it very uncomfortable for these pharmaceutical industries who have not catered for the fact that they have allowed the research to happen. We've done the research, we've delivered our part, and we're not seeing Cabalet, nor are we really getting, in my opinion, authentic information about when it's coming, why it's not coming sooner, and how much it's going to cost when it does arrive. Well, I think, you know, I really would love to see this population rise up and make it very uncomfortable for Vive Healthcare and whoever else is out there that is preventing access to this infection saving intervention. Thank you. Well, well, um, well uh, you know, Linda, it's hard you making that comment. It's hard, you know, it's 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 obviously there's no one to defend. You know, th there's no defense possible, right? But of course, when we do these studies, there's a pretrial access agreement, and then we're counting on the goodwill of the companies and the countries to make it happen. And unfortunately, and by the way, our the problem we're seeing with cabotegravir, and there's the cabotegravir table. I'll let them speak for themselves. The official cabotegravir table. I'll turn it over to them for a second. One of them, at least. I think Vive is a very immature, Vive is not Glaxo. I don't think Vive was prepared for the success that they've experienced. And so we're seeing the maturation of what was not really a pharmaceutical company into a pharmaceutical company. Unfortunately, the, the consequences of that are the performance that you've just described above and beyond the cost and everything else. I will say that when we proved that HIV treatment worked, it wasn't like overnight, all that you, you'll remember the activism required and the time required for treatment to become treatment that was universally available. It wasn't a year. It was like a decade, probably, maybe more than a decade. So the cabotegravir table, who's going to speak on behalf of cabotegravir? The two of you, the two of you are together. Can you speak at the, in, in like a duet? Uh, Mike. Wait, one, one second. So, Linda Gale, I can't argue with you. Uh, I mean, I think it's painful to have worked with 20 fantastic sites and enrolled almost three and a half thousand women and to have delivered the result we've delivered particularly for cisgender women in the region and to see the slow pace of rollout. I think that we tried to anticipate the questions that might be barriers to rollout and we have small successes but I think and I, I think you know, kind of we can re reflect that, as Mike has said, you know, kind of maybe Viva are inexperienced, maybe no one expected the success that they did, maybe we had success in the middle of COVID when the world has been distracted, but the bottom line is we do have a duty, I think, to be active in expressing the need for this product to be made available, and I would be deeply saddened uh, if having done what the network has done don't see kind of access in our region and I think hopefully over the you know kind of coming days we can think about what it is that we need to do as a community that does express to some extent 
our deep concern about the kind of pace of access. And also, I think, reflect on what this means for other products that are going to come down the pipeline. This is not going to be any different for lenacapavir, which right. is also a complicated molecule, or BNAD. So it is a bigger issue. And the last thing to say is that I think um, one of the talks uh, that will be given is, I think, trying to get to grips with how we as a network begin to engage with what are difficult concepts where, where we are not the only actor, but what we can do, at least, I think, to kind of move progress ahead and not be in the right. position that we currently are. I think, Linda Gale, I, I, I thank you. For the, I mean, I do think this is a velo this is not a question of is this going to happen. This is a velocity question, and what you're really unhappy about, rightly so, is velocity. Okay, and the same thing happened with treatment. Right? Why was treatment not available in Africa while it was available in other places until there was enough energy for the velocity to 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 proceed at the proper thing? So, I don't think Vive, and I'm not trying to defend Vive in any way. They understand this is an absolute obligation, but they're slow walking what you think ought to be like their most urgent. They shouldn't be more development until they actually deliver to those communities that made their product exist. And I don't think anybody can, they can't argue with you. So it's, thank you for your comment. Um, who you you're back but now you've switched sides is there is it a different is it a different question now that you're on the other side is it another topic no i just want to follow up to what, what linda Gill was saying i mean when when art was introduced in 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 the in the u.s in 97 mortality started decreasing it took 10 years for art to be rolled out at scale in africa so that's a 10-year gap that we don't want to repeat for current intervention and future intervention so and the thing is, it, that's, and I agree with them, Miguel, that's us. Because if we leave it up to industry, it's going to take 10 years. So that's really on us to make sure that, that it doesn't take 10 years. Thank you, Hoop. Let me, let, me, let me say one thing. First, we really appreciate discussion. We, we shouldn't be here if you're not going to go to the microphone. So I let this go into your break, and we won't compromise your break. We'll just have the break, and then we'll come back, because we're not going anywhere. We're prisoners of the hotel. So, so um I really appreciate that people went to the microphone and had discussion. I suggest you really, everybody has questions and they were really good questions. So thank you for that. Now, before we break, Ayanna Moore has some important logistical and other comments. Allow Ayanna Moore to make such comments. <laughs> 